Some of the 302s. And when you don't show up at a meeting that we request behind closed doors, kind of lose that opportunity. If I could, now, now, now we're going to recognize the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Gowdy. Agent Herring, did the FBI interview the sender of all emails that contain classified information? You know, I don't know the answer to that question, only because I'm a ledge affairs guy. I was on the investigative team. Can you find out? You would agree with me it'd be important. I mean, you'd want to interview the person who sent the classified information, Certainly. right? Certainly. But because uh, the recipient thought the C was just the third letter in the alphabet. It, you might be curious whether or not the sender also was clueless in the way he or she viewed classified information, would you not? That would be a logical uh, investigative step. Can you find out whether or not you interviewed the sender of all emails that contain classified information? Certainly. Uh, do you uh, know if the sender of any of the classified emails knew that the information was classified at the time? I don't personally know that. I wasn't a part of the investigative team. I'm sure that... Can you find out? Certainly. Can you find out for me? Yes, sir. Um, there are folks wondering how information gets from a classified source into an email. Did your investigation shed any light on how classified information could get from a classified system into an unclassified email to even be sent? I'm not even talking about the receiving of it. I'm talking about the sending of it. I'm sure they did look at that. Um, that would be sort of a logical question you would ask uh, as an investigator in a case like this. Uh, That's what I thought. But in my, my legislative sort of affairs capacity, I just don't have that kind of business. Well, don't sell yourself short. You used to be an agent, right? Still an agent, right? Still. So you know what you're doing. Did the FBI grant immunity to anyone during the course of this investigation? Uh, for immunity questions, I'd have to defer to the Department of Justice for that. It wouldn't be a, an agent who would, who would grant that kind of thing. That Did the Bureau the recommend the granting of immunity? I, I do not know. Do you know. Do you know whether the Department of Justice granted immunity to any witnesses? I know I saw, I, I saw some articles last week, but that's the extent of it. Well, surely you got better sources than the media for that, don't you? You can ask the guy sitting two people down from you. I would have to defer to the Department of Justice, sir. Do you know whether any witnesses asserted any privileges while they were being interviewed? I don't know. But the Bureau would know that, right? Because they would have asserted the privilege while you were in there. I'm sorry? You, the Bureau would know that, right? Because that, that privilege would have been asserted perhaps while you were in there. Conducting the interview. What kind of privilege are you talking about? Like attorney client privilege? Or oh, there are a bunch of privileges. There's priest penitent. I'm guessing that one didn't come up. There's doctor patient. I'm guessing that one didn't come up. There's uh, the Fifth Amendment privilege against incrimination. That one might have come up. Attorney client privilege. Uh, again, there have been media reports that that one came up. Sir, I just don't know the answer to those questions. Um, have you ever heard the, uh, had the attorney-client privilege come up during any of your investigations? Certainly. Who does the privilege belong to? The client. So the client can waive it, right? Can. You understand why Congress might want to know whether or not the attorney-client privilege was waived and who the client was? I can, I can certainly imagine. Yeah, me too. That's why we want to see the file, agent. I mean, you say it's unprecedented. Mr. Cummings used to be a criminal defense attorney. He got to see all your 302s. Ken Buck used to be an assistant United States attorney. He got to see all your 302s. Probation officers get to see all your 302s. Why can't Congress? Sir, I think we have tried to um, provide the information in a way that is understandable. I think the investigative summary tells kind of the story. And I, I do think that the 302s that we provided are, are the important ones. Well, let me ask you this. Um, if those summaries were all anyone ever needed, why don't you just introduce those in trial? Why actually call the witness? Well, certainly we were we actually trying to make your life a little bit easier in the light of the, the but see, of But see, I don't want my life being made easier. I, I don't want that. I want to know what was said in the 302s. Because the 302 is itself a summary of an interview, right? It's not a verbatim transcript. That's correct. So you have given me the summary of a summary of an interview. And, and I'm not asking for a verbatim transcript because you don't have one. Certainly. I'm just asking for the 302. Yep. 
So I don't have to read your summary. I may read the 302 differently from the way you read it. So why not? So I think we've given you the, the, the relevant ones as we... If we if relevant we according to whom? I am telling you, I don't think you've given me all the relevant 302s. Well, the, rema the remainder of the 302s will come out through the FOIA process. I, but, but, but since when did Congress have to go through FOIA Correct. to obtain 302s from an investigation that's not even resulting in any prosecutions that your boss has already said is over? Since when did we have to go through FOIA? So I think that the 302s we have provided, uh, I think that we made a principled decision about what to provide. Uh, it was certainly made at the highest levels of my agency. All right, I, I'm out of time. That's what that knocking sounds. I, I'm just going to say with all due respect, um, you don't get to decide what we think is relevant. And I do say that respectfully. Uh, the defense attorneys get it all. I think Congress ought to get it all. Mr. Speaker, I'll withdraw my point of order and rise in opposition to the motion to recommit. The reservation is withdrawn and the gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to talk uh, for just a moment as colleagues, not as Republicans or Democrats, not as members of the majority or the minority, but colleagues who are blessed to serve in the United States House of Representatives, the People's House, with all the tradition, with all the history, with all the laws that have been passed, with all the lives that have been impacted. I want us to talk as colleagues because our foundational document gave us as the House unique powers and responsibilities. We run every two years because they intended for us to be closest to the people. The President was given different duties and powers. The President was given the duty to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. So my question, Mr. Speaker, is what does that mean to you? that the laws be faithfully executed. We know the President can veto a bill for any reason or no reason. We know the President can refuse to defend the constitutionality of a statute, even one that he signs into law. We know the President can issue pardons for violations of the very laws that we pass. And we know that the President has prosecutorial discretion as evidenced and used through his U.S. attorneys. Mr. Speaker, that is a lot of power. What are we to do when that amount of power is not enough? What are we to do when this President or any President decides to selectively enforce a portion of a law and ignore other portions of that law? What do we do, Mr. Speaker, regardless of motivation, when a president nullifies our vote by failing to faithfully execute the law? How do we explain waivers and exemptions and delays in a bill passed by Congress and affirmed by the United States Supreme Court? How do we explain away a refusal to enforce mandatory minimums that were passed by Congress and affirmed by the Supreme Court? And why pursue, Mr. Speaker, immigration reform if presidents can turn off the very provisions that we pass? You know, in the oath that, that brand new citizens take, it contains six different references to the law. If it's good enough for us to ask brand new citizens to affirm their devotion to the law, is it too much to ask that the president do the same? If a president... If a president can change some laws, can he change all laws? Can he change election laws? Can he change discrimination laws? Are there any laws under your theory that he actually has to enforce? What is our recourse, Mr. Speaker? What is our remedy? Some would argue the framers gave us the power of the purse and the power of impeachment, but Mr. Speaker, those are punishments. Those are not remedies. What is the remedy if we want the executive to enforce our work? This bill simply gives us standing when our votes are nullified. This bill allows us to petition the judicial branch for an order requiring the executive branch to faithfully execute the law. Mr. Speaker, we are not held in high public esteem right now. 
maybe members of Congress would be respected more if we respected ourselves enough to require that when we pass something, it be treated as law. Maybe we would be more respected if we had a firmly rooted expectation that when we pass something as law, it be treated as law. Maybe we would be more respected if we put down party labels and a desire to keep or retain or acquire gavels and picked up the history, the tradition, and the honor of this, the people's house. Mr. Speaker, the House of Representatives does not exist to pass suggestions. We do not exist to pass ideas. We make law. And while you are free to stand and clap, when any president comes into this hallowed chamber and promises to do it with or without you, I will never stand and clap when any president, no matter whether he's your party or mine, promises to make us a constitutional anomaly and an afterthought. We make law. Expired. I'm sure they did look at that. Um, that would be sort of a logical question you would ask uh, as an investigator in a case like this. Uh, That's what I thought. But in my, my legislative sort of affairs capacity, I just don't have that kind of visibility. Well, don't say yourself short. You used to be an agent, right? Still an agent, right? Still, so you know what you're doing. Did the FBI grant immunity to anyone during the course of this investigation? Uh, for immunity questions, I'd have to defer to the Department of Justice for that. It wouldn't be a, an agent who would, who would grant that kind of thing. That did the Bureau the recommend the granting of immunity? I do not know. Do you know, do you know whether the Department of Justice granted immunity to any witnesses? I know I saw, I, I saw some articles last week, but that's the extent of Well, surely you got better sources than the media for that, don't you? You can ask the guy sitting two people down from you. I would have to defer to the Department of Justice, sir. Do you know whether any witnesses asserted any privileges while they were being interviewed? I don't know. But the Bureau would know that, right? Because they would have asserted the privilege while you were in there. I'm sorry? You, the Bureau would know that, right? Because that, that privilege would have been asserted perhaps while you were in there conducting the interview. What kind of privilege are you talking about, like attorney-client privilege? Or oh, there privilege are a bunch of privileges. There's priest-penitent. I'm guessing that one didn't come up. There's doctor-patient. I'm guessing that one didn't come up. There's uh, the Fifth Amendment privilege against incrimination. That one might have come up. Attorney-client privilege, uh, again, there have been media reports that that one came up. Sir, I just don't know the answer to those questions. Um, have you ever heard the, uh, had the attorney-client privilege come up during any of your investigations? Certainly. Who does the privilege belong to? Emails that contain classified information? Certainly. Uh, do you uh, know if the sender of any of the classified emails knew that the information was classified at the time? I don't personally know that. I wasn't part of the investigative team. I'm sure that... Can that, you find out? Certainly. Can you find out for me? Yes, sir. Um, there are folks wondering how information gets from a classified source into an email. Did your investigation shed any light on how classified information could get from a classified system into an unclassified email to even be sent? I'm not even talking about the receiving of it. I'm talking about the sending of it. Client. So the client can waive it, right? Can. You understand why Congress might want to know whether or not the attorney-client privilege was waived and who the client was? I can, I can certainly imagine. Yeah, me too. That's why we want to see the file, agent. I mean, you say it's unprecedented. Mr. Cummings used to be a criminal defense attorney. He got to see all your 302s. Ken Buck used to be an assistant United States attorney. He got to see all your 302s. Probation officers get to see all your 302s. 
Why can't Congress? Sir, I think we have tried to um, provide the information. Some of the 302s. And when you don't show up at a meeting that we request behind closed doors, kind of lose that opportunity. If I could, now, now, we're now we're going to recognize the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Gowdy. Agent Herring, did the FBI interview the sender of all emails that contain classified information? You know, I don't know the answer to that question, only because I'm a ledge affairs guy. I was on the investigative team. Can you find out? You would agree with me it would be important. I mean, you'd want to interview the person who sent the classified information, Certainly. right? Certainly. B because uh, the recipient thought the C was just the third letter in the alphabet. It, you might be curious whether or not the sender also was clueless in the way he or she viewed classified information, would you not? That would be a logical uh, investigative step. Can you find out whether or not you interviewed the sender of all 